Grace and peace to you from the one true living and loving God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We are glad that you are with us for worship on this third Sunday of November. Salem United Church of Christ welcomes you and is glad to have you with us in this virtual way. If there's any way that you believe the church can be of help to you, do please be in contact with us. You'll find all our contact information on our website. And for now, let's join together in a responsive call to worship. The dwelling place of God is with the people of God. Come into the time of worship, not to wring your hands in worry, but to raise your voice in praise. God reigns even here, even now, in this time, in this place. There's no defeat in these circumstances we are in. God reigns, let the earth be glad. God rules, let my soul rejoice. And let us pray together. Open our eyes to see, O Lord. Open our ears to hear. And open our hearts to believe. There is victory in Jesus, and his glory, outshining the sun, is over and around us. Grant us to bring this kind of faith into our lives, into our homes, into our church, and into our society, and help us to give voice to it now. Amen. Now join me please in a prayer of confession. Living and reigning Christ, sovereign over all, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But we confess that we are ever tempted by and sometimes succumb to the fascinations and machinations of the principalities and powers of earthly empires and the appeal of their undeliverable promises. You alone are our peace and hope and joy and wealth. In you we can have all we can dream and all we can need, but we look elsewhere. 
Much of it is because we do not want to surrender authority and control to anyone but ourselves. When will we make the proper concession that can heal what is broken in us and by us? O King of kings and Lord of lords, have mercy on us and let your love rule in our hearts. Amen. If we say we have no sin, the scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will pardon us of all unrighteousness. On the basis of that scripture word, I declare that your sin is forgiven. Thanks and praise be to God. Let us pray. Lord God of all, you have seen divided nations before and have heard the prayers of opposing sides each asking that they be blessed and that their opponents be changed. Please do for us in our divided time what you did in other days and other emergencies. Shape us in such a way that disagreement can be healthy again and give rise to new ideas, to a spirit of cooperation and to a general advance of the common good. Inspire the heroism of compromise and the valor of public service. Offer a day when all who hold public office merit public trust and there really is liberty and justice for all. Help us to look to you in all things and for all things, and may our love for you grow each day. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught every disciple to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today, some selected verses from the first chapter of the book of Revelation, and then skipping way ahead one verse from the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. Listen along with me for the word of God. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from him who was, and who is, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests, serving his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash across his chest. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last 
and the living one. I was dead and see, I'm alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you've seen, what is, and what is to take place after this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty thunder peals crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the word of Scripture be the truth that we study. May your spirit be our teacher. And may your glory be the purpose that we seek to achieve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our study of how the God of yesterday and today is depicted in Scripture brings us today to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book. Now that word apocalyptic sounds strange, uh, maybe a bit Stephen King-ish or Steven Spielberg-ish. Spielberg um, it's a word that is foreign to us and maybe instills just a little bit of fear. But we can be helped a great deal when we stop to realize that the word apocalypse is the Greek word for revelation. To reveal something is to bring it to light. To reveal something is to show it. And the book of Revelation is a showing of something to be true. The truth that is shown by the book of Revelation is a truth that is shown first to persecuted people in the early Christian decades. The author of Revelation uses a literary style that makes liberal use of symbols and he writes as if he is talking about the future. But the inspired author of Revelation is less interested in the future that is yet to come than he is in the reality that's right outside his own window in his present time. What the writer of Revelation wants to do is to use the technique of symbolism and futuristic writing to show those persecuted people what God is doing right then and there in their lives, right then and there in their own troubling situation. The book of Revelation is more a book of comfort than it is a book of predictions. It's a book that seeks to console more than it seeks to prognosticate. Or help too when we see that what is the center of theological gravity in the book of Revelation. The key to understanding the book of Revelation is understanding where it places the center of theological gravity. Some interpreters of this book skew things off in the wrong direction by placing the center of theological gravity in the future in some decisive act that God has yet to perform. A better view, a more balanced view of the book of Revelation sees that the author of Revelation puts the center of theological gravity in a decisive event of the past, a decisive event that has already taken place and is now in the present day working itself out in time and in history and in the lives of people. We Revelation wants to say we get faith right, we get life right, not when we try and predict a, a distant and cataclysmic future, but when we remain loyal to Jesus, who died and who rose and who lives even now. Revelation shows this truth by way of several images. 
We'll take time this morning just to lift up a small handful of them. And we begin with the image of the lampstands. Chapter 1 of the book of Revelation speaks of lampstands. Now, a lampstand is what it, it's, 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 a lampstand isn't itself the lamp. The lampstand isn't itself the light. The lampstand is something that holds the lamp and holds the light high so that it can have a, a farther reach, a better reach. And the author of Revelation compares the work of the early church, compares the work of early Christians to the lampstand. The church is in itself the light. The early Christians weren't themselves the light. God was the light. But the work of the lampstands was to hold high the light of God in a darkened world so that that light could be seen and could show forth what needed to be shown forth. And the writer was saying that those little fellowships, those little churches that were in existence in those first Christian decades were doing their best at that work to hold high the light of God. They were doing their best against terrible circumstances. There was rejection. There was persecution. There were money problems. There were loyalty problems. There was conflict within as well as pressure from without. And so the work of the lampstands was, was hard work. But, Revelation says, there was one who was moving in and about and among all the lampstands of all the little fellowships and all the cities where a church was established. There was one moving about amongst them. The author of Revelation caught vision of one like the Son of Man moving among these lampstands. Well, that was Jesus. Jesus was moving amongst the lampstands. Jesus was moving among the churches. He wasn't far and removed and away from them. He wasn't distant and gone forever. He was right there, sandals on the ground with them. And he understood all that they were going through. He knew all the difficulties they were facing. He saw all the hardships that were theirs to bear. Revelation was telling those early Christians, you're not alone. Christ is with you right in your midst and understands all the difficulties you're having and all the troubles. Well, translate that into our own day. I'm sure you can translate that into our own day. And you see that nothing is easy for us today. Nothing is easy for the church. Nothing is easy uh, for individual Christians. We're lampstands, trying our best to hold high the light of the truth of God for the world to see. But the strong winds of culture threaten to blow us over. And the rumblings of society uh, shake the ground beneath us and threaten to topple us. Uh, but still, our efforts are not unnoticed. Christ takes note of what we do, knows what we're going through, and is with us right here, right now, in our midst. From the image of the lampstands, I turn now to the image of the throne. Uh, the image of the lampstand stands out in chapter 1. The image of the throne stands out in chapter 4 especially. Uh, the throne, the, the image of the throne is one of the most prominent themes in the book of Revelation. Some variation of the word throne appears 62 times in the New Testament. 62 times in the New Testament. 47 of those are in the book of Revelation. 62 times in the New Testament, 47 of those are in the book of Revelation. And 14 of those are in chapter 4. Chapter 4 of Revelation sets the theme for this book. It captures the vision of the throne of God, and it's a grand thing. There's lightning and thunder and music all around it. Uh, there's, there's gold and uh, glory. 
The throne of God is a grand thing, nothing small, nothing tawdry. The writer of a book of Revelation wants people uh, he, to, to, to look up from the trouble that's all around them, to look up and to see the throne of God that is over and above them. The, in that fourth chapter of Revelation, the, 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 the writer can uh, hardly speak a sentence without mentioning the word throne, 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 throne. Fourteen times over the, the word appears. God, the writer of Revelation wants people to see that throne of God, that marvelous throne of God that has glory all around it and power. Why? Why? Well, because those Christians persecuted in those early Christian decades were under the threat of the Roman Empire. They were under the threat of the Roman Emperor. They were under the, the, the power of the throne of Rome. Um, they were under the control of an earthly throne. The emperor had military power. He had economic power. He had legislative power. Uh, he had economic power. He had power over life and over death. A thumbs up or a thumbs down meant everything, not the fate of people. They were inescapably under the throne of Rome, and that throne seemed undefeatable, inescapable unstoppable. Revelation wants people to see there's another throne. There's another throne. A throne that is higher than the throne of God, a thr uh, th uh, than the throne of Rome. A, thro a throne that is better than the throne of Rome. A throne that rules more than the throne of Rome. A throne that is even over the throne of Rome. It's the throne of God, majestic and marvelous in every way. And that vision brings hope brings hope because it says Rome doesn't have the last word. God has the last word. God is the one who reigns in spite of that military power and legislative power and economic power. God is the one who reigns. Well, translate that. Translate that into the present day. I'm sure you can. Something reckless seems to be in the driver's seat these days and we feel as though we are careening off in every direction none of which is safe wrong seems to be in control power seems to be in the wrong hands and the forces against us seem to be unmatched and inescapable but Christ is in our midst and God is on the throne God is on the throne of real power. Look up, look up and see that and take hope. Chapter one of Revelation tells about the lampstands. Chapter four of Revelation tells about the throne. Chapter five tells the image of the lamb. The image of the lamb. The lamb is Christ himself. He's shown to be, he's depicted as the sacrificial lamb who's been slaughtered, who's been butchered. But still he lives. Still he lives. Christ was dead, but Christ rose, and Christ lives now. And not only does Christ live now, he is worthy. He's worthy. We can sometimes think that the book of Revelation is a book full of frightening things. It's really a book full of music. At first there are just a, just a few singers, just a few singers. But gradually there are more, and then there are more, and then there are more. And suddenly the author says that those who are singing number myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, and ultimately, it's the voices are those of everyone in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. The sea the, being one of the most mysterious things to those, 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 those early Christians in ancient days. Every voice, 
Every voice in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea sings of the worthiness of Jesus Christ. All of these are singing from the same hymnal and they're singing from the same page in the hymnal. They're singing the same song and their song tells of the worthiness of the worth of Jesus Christ. His wonderful worthiness. Well, why is he worthy? Why is he worthy? And the answer is this. When God is seated on the throne in the book of Revelation, um, there's a scroll in God's hand, a scroll. And people can tell that it's full of writing. The page is, is full of writing on the front and on the back. It's God's notebook. It's God's handy dandy notebook. It contains God's ideas, God's plans. God, it's got the, the, the rationale of the whole universe in that notebook. Here is the why and the wherefore of everything. But this notebook in God's hand is sealed. It's thoroughly sealed. It has seven seals around it. Nobody in heaven can open it. Nobody in heaven can open it. When the one in the author of Revelation first has this vision, he can see that nobody can open that notebook of God because it's so sealed. He weeps. He weeps because nobody in heaven. And then finally somebody says, somebody says, the lamb is worthy. The lamb can open it. Christ alone is able to open the seals of that scroll. And that's... That's why I meant, said that um, Christ who died and who rose and who lives is the center of theological gravity in the book of Revelation. Christ alone is the one who is worthy to peer into this book. Christ alone is the one who can interpret life and eternity. Not alone is the, uh, Christ alone is the one who can interpret truth. Well, apply that to today. Apply that and, and see that if, 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 if you want to know how to live, if you want to know how to get through this pandemic, if you want to know how to navigate this terribly difficult time in which we live, if you want to know how we can be the church, if you want to know how you can be a better Christian, if you want to know how you can structure your life, know that Jesus is the one who has the secret of life and get yourself to him. He knows and he will help you. That's why he alone is awesome and everything else just pretends to be awesome. Christ alone is worthy. He's the lamb who was slain. He was dead, he rose, and he lives, and he understands all eternity and all eternal truth. Now we've talked about the lampstands, talked about the throne, talked about the lamb. I'll raise for you just, just one more of the symbols and images from the book of Revelation, and that's the image of victory. The image of victory. There's all kinds of battles that take place in the book of Revelation. And some of the interpreters who skew the book off in the wrong direction interpret these battles as though they take place in sequence. First there has to be this battle, and then that battle, and then the next one, and then ultimately the last battle. And really, I think a better understanding of Revelation sees that these aren't battles that happen in sequence. These are really just depictions of, 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 of the battle, the battle, that happens all the time. Always. It's the battle between good and evil. Revelation shows that evil, monstrous though it can be, loses every time. Well, sometimes it has temporary victories. Sometimes evil has the upper hand. But evil is doomed to lose. It's doomed to lose because the overwhelming and overpowering goodness of God will prevail. 
And God not only wins the victory, God shares the victory with us. I spoke a little bit ago about the song that was, songs that were sung in Revelation. The saying that first there were a few singers and then more, then more, then myriads and myriads of them, thousands and thousands. At first, too, just a few share in the victory, but then the number grows. Early in Revelation, it speaks of uh, 12, 24 elders, 24 elders who are robed in white and have crowns and are around the throne of God as partakers in the victory. But by the time we get to chapter 7, there are 144,000 who share in the victory. Now, some interpreters use 144,000 as kind of a, a cap on the redeemed, a, a limitation of the number who can be redeemed, that many and no more. I think a better view of Revelation sees 144,000 not as a cap on up, um, um, not as a cap on the redeemed, but rather as the opposite of limitation. Why do I say that? Well, numbers are almost always important in the Bible. And the number 12 is the number of completeness. There were 12 disciples. There were 12 disciples because there were 12 tribes of Israel, the, the whole um, company of Israel. And there were 12 tribes of Israel because there were 12 sons of Jacob. 12 is the, is the symbol for completeness. When, when um, uh, Judas took his life and was no longer present, no longer part of the group of disciples, there were just 11, and, and they needed to have 12. They needed to be complete, and so they, they chose another. 12 is important. Well, remember your math. 12 times 12 is 144. Completeness, 12. Completeness times completeness. 12 times 12. Completeness times completeness is 144. And now Revelation multiplies that a thousand times over. Completeness times completeness a thousand times over. 144,000. That's who's going to be part of the redeemed. That's the a sign of the extravagant grace of God. Revelation ends up telling it this way. There's a great multitude that no one can count from every nation, from all tribes, people, and languages. They all stand before the throne, robed, redeemed, and rejoicing. Now listen to me well. This is not any form of Christian triumphalism because it's not saying the church alone has the victory. It's not alone saying that Christianity has the victory. The victory is broader than the church, broader than Christianity. It, it's all inclusive, takes in that whole world and everyone in it. Still, we struggle. We are still lampstands against the wind and our work feels insecure in society against the uh, the press of society and against the press of change and all the problems that are around us. But ultimately, the victory is ours because the victory belongs to Christ. And Christ gives the victory to us to share. Well, a sermon like this has two purposes. One is to put the book of Revelation within your reach. And the other, more important, is to put the God of Revelation in your heart. I pray that you put this God of the book of Revelation in your heart. Um, the struggle is great, and defeat seems to be always close at hand, but God is awesome, and God is awesomely for you. God is awesomely on your side. So fight on, fight on with hope, stay loyal to Jesus Christ. That is the key to understanding and facing life as we live it. Trust in this God amid the lampstands. Trust 
in this God who occupies the throne. Trust in this God who's revealed in the Lamb and trust in this God who gives you the victory. Let us pray. Thank you, O Lord, for the message of the book of Revelation. Help us to take it in and not be afraid of it, but to rejoice in it, to believe it, and to face our lives today in its strength and in its promise. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, our teacher and master and Lord, who lives and reigns with you, one God forevermore. Amen. How the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Even that peace of Jesus Christ which passes all understanding. The peace the world cannot give or take away. Amen.